Wait, sorry. Oh, this is where he gives me a kiss before. Oh, no. Oh, I think we love you. <laughs> Hello, friends. Ginny D here, and I'm here today with one of my DMs, Jesse Jerdak, who you may know from his own YouTube channel or from some of the videos on my channel. He was in Jester's Mom, but he was painted green, so you might not recognize him. Jester's Mom, you've got it going on. One of the reasons why we're doing this specifically today is that Jesse actually wrote the one-shot adventure that's included with my 2022 calendar, Natural 22. The adventure is called Bard Behind Bars. If you want to play or read or in any way experience that one-shot, you can get it with a deluxe edition of my Natural 22 calendar. Or you can purchase the one-shot adventure as a PDF on my website, and I'll put the link in the description, and it's great. So I asked on Twitter for your most pressing questions about how to create one-shot adventures, and today we are going to try to answer them. What do you think are the most important things to include in a one-shot adventure? I start with... Uh, an emotion that I want to evoke with the entire mm -hmm. arc. So is it going to be whimsical and fun and quirky and cute, or is it going to be sad? Spoiler, both for Jesse. Or is it is it a scary thing that is also whimsical and sad? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those things are non-negotiable. Practically speaking, do you think that a one-shot has to or should include combat or puzzles or like mm. a mystery? I like to include literally all of those elements in every one shot I release. Even if I can't guarantee that the players aren't going to engage in those individual elements. Uh, I want them to be there for people that enjoy them. One of the things that I really liked about the way that you wrote Bard Behind Bars mm. is that you have what is one of my favorite puzzles that I've ever seen. You include ways that that puzzle can be incorporated into the story even if the players aren't interested in sitting down and working out a logic puzzle. If a, if a player is not great at figuring out puzzles, their, their character might be. You know, that's, that's the great thing about those D20s is they can solve a lot of problems. Let's dive into the stuff that Twitter was asking about. Mm. I saw basically two questions come up over and over and over in the Twitter thread. The main one, the one that came up the most, was how do you manage time and predict how long a one-shot is gonna take mm. and prevent it from turning into a two-shot or a three-shot or like a five-shot, which I think happens to a lot of people. Yeah, typically combat, you're talking a minimum of 45 minutes, every combat. So if you throw three combats in there, you're looking at about a three hour adventure no matter what you do. And uh, as far as like pacing the rest of it, RP is gonna RP. Yes. <laughs> um, I like to add like little notes. Hey, here's a good point for RP, but maybe you don't have five hours to dedicate to this. So, you know, here's an NPC that can help move things along just in case. When I was working on the mermaid one-shot adventure with my other DM, Harlan, one of the things that I ran into when I was running that adventure was my players really got into the roleplay at the very beginning. And it was to the point where I was like, oh man, we really got to get them into the ocean <laughs> to engage with the mermaids. The decision that I made, which was made very easy by the way that Harlan had put that adventure together, was to just nix one of the NPCs completely. There were three different NPCs you could interact with, and each of them had a few pieces of the puzzle that would be helpful, and you didn't have to see all of them in order to put together those pieces. If they hit a point where they're like, we got it, we figured it out. They can move forward and they're not missing anything by skipping one of those NPCs. I did that with Veilstone actually. Since I ran it for you the first time, I've run it like three times since. Every group skips a different NPC. It's mm. really wild. It's great to have optional content that isn't, you know, mandatory for your players to progress and also so you can keep things snappy. It sounds like it's crucial that putting together the pieces that take you to the final encounter not necessarily be linear. Mm. Because if it's linear, then it's harder to skip something. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, linear is, it's, it's a two-edged sword because also it gives your players a clear path of progression. Right. So as long as they know what's next, they can go to that. Um, but it is important that they stumble over exactly what they need to stumble over. Let's say your players miss something really important or they skip something really important. How do you stay on your toes and make sure that they can still get the information they need to complete the one shot? I like to say this, no matter what they're looking for, everywhere they're looking, that's where it is. If it's a note, a, a, a secret note with, with, the, with the, the, the key to the puzzle on it, they're not looking where you think it should be, but maybe they're like, I wanna rummage through the kitchen drawers. Turns out it's there. You know, I want to look in the couch cushions. Oh, there's a note in there. I like that because then you're not pushing the players to do something specific. They don't have to feel railroaded, but they do sort of get the satisfaction of being like, oh yes, I had a good idea. And mm -hmm. I did indeed find the clue. And that question of railroading came up a lot in mm. relation to this question. Basically like, how do you keep players on track with still allowing them to feel like they're the ones making the choices? Because one of the things I've noticed in your one shots is that you, you do a good job of picking a setting for the one shot 
that is pretty contained. Constraining the setting is, is, is like mandatory. You have to because if you throw too much at folks, then they're going to explore in a lot of different directions and that's where your time goes. And if you don't mind making a one shot, a three shot, that's also okay. The second most commonly asked question in this thread was, how do you get players or even just their characters involved or invested in the arc of the one shot when you've just dropped them right into it? If you present a problem, they're gonna wanna solve it because other than that, they can take their dice and and uh, I don't know, what do, you, what do you do at that point? We're here to play D&D, friends. When we all collect at the table to play D&D, we are entering a good faith agreement as a group mm -hmm. that we all are here to play a game together and that we want to have fun with it. So I also think it's okay as a DM to just be like, listen, your characters care about this because like, that's the that's the barrier to entry. But if you present like somebody that's clearly in distress or that there is a clear reward or that there's a clear problem that just you can't avoid. A sub part of this question Ooh. is like, how do you get the adventure hook sort of on the table and out there quickly enough to get everybody moving? Cause you don't really want to spend the first 30 minutes of what could maybe be only a three or four hour one shot mm -hmm. trying to convince people to participate. You get to frame this. You get to set the stakes right out the gate. Like you're in, you, you as the author are in control of this. Like you don't have to be like, you meet in your favorite tavern discussing drinks. Well, and I think that's one thing that makes One Shot special in comparison to a campaign. You don't have to have the lead up if you don't want to. When I was writing an adventure for Steamforged Games and I submitted my first draft to my contact, he suggested to me that I cut basically like the first three paragraphs that I had written and was like, you want to throw people in in the action so that they are immediately engaged. And I ended up cutting a bunch off the front end and starting the adventure with a combat. When I read it back, I was like, oh, this is so much more interesting. Like you jump right in and there's pressure on you and there's time constraints and like things are happening. Uh, how much combat should it even have? Like how do you how do you decide on a combat to roleplay balance? Depends on what kind of adventure you want to run. It can be just all combat. Some people love that. You know, bring your weirdest, most powerful, most wildly min-maxed character to this and let's just fight tough bad guys. Like if that's the kind of one shot you want to make, let's do that. That's And great. tell people if it's going to be that kind of one shot. Because I've definitely played in some stuff where I show up with like a dramatic backstory and like a roleplay play a focused character and then we just fight the whole time and then I'm like but she has a troubled relationship with her sister everyone <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a great point set the stage at, at, before the session like when you're like saying hey do you want to do a one shot it's all about fighting I think you should err on the side of telling people more rather than less about the one shot because it's so easy for someone to build a character that's not suited to it and then you just end up with sort of like a frustrating game I also think it's a good idea that you know what kind of balance you want and you think about that when you're piecing together all the different sections. Because I do think it can be easy to end up with a combat heavy or role play heavy encounter by accident. I always set out, uh, and, and you and, and Laura, is, am, I, am I allowed to gesture to Laura over there? No, it's against the law. Police! <laughs> have, have heard me say I use the rule of threes. I like to have 30% uh, combat, 30% RP, and 30% problem solving. So pretty much anything that I write is going to have that 30-30-30 I guess it's 33%. Yeah, what's the other 10%, Jesse? Someone asked this and I'm glad they did because I wanted to ask it also, which mm. is how do you conclude a one shot in a way that feels meaningful when you know that these characters aren't gonna come back or be used for anything else? I, I think what you need to do is give them the carrot that they're efforting towards, right? What is the carrot? Is the carrot the story? Is it the is it the friends we made along the way? Oh, it is. <laughs> you know, this is an interesting thing to hear you say because I think with Veilstone, without spoiling anything, a lot of the way that that adventure arc moves just naturally is towards an ending that's gonna be very bittersweet for people. That comes back to one of my very favorite pieces of D&D advice, and it's that um, you don't write the story, you write the story that will happen if the players don't involve themselves. I like that thought process too. The idea of you know what will happen if the players don't do anything. And then whenever the players do make a decision, all you have to do is determine how that's gonna impact the existing arc. Yep. One of the things that threw me is at the very end of, so I keep talking about the mermaid one shot, this is the most recent that's, one shot I okay, read. So at the end of the mermaid one shot, I had my, my players were looking for loot and I was like, we're about to be done. Like, I don't know what to do with this. So should I give you loot? Does it matter? How do you use loot in a one shot if you do? You want your loot to be functional. So if you give it to them in the middle of the adventure, then they can play with it. Last question that I want to address here, which I think is not going to be relevant to everyone, but let's assume that you're writing a one 
one-shot for other DMs to run, not just for yourself to run. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you write something that other DMs are gonna know enough about it to run it, but not so much that you're unloading a ton of information on them that, that may overwhelm? This is a great one for us, I think, specifically, <laughs> because you've seen my writing style. It's it's like a lot. It's like, I write like a, a, like a love letter to the DM, and then uh, you help me edit some stuff down, and you're like, None of that was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> but in a loving way. Yeah. I think this really speaks to the kind of DM that you are too, personally, which is that you're an over-preparer. That's just like who you are. Yeah. And I think you can see that in the way that you write one-shots. In And a lot of DMs might really love that. They might really love that you give them a lot of information. I think you can also easily go the other direction and not give DMs enough information. And that can also be really hard to run a one-shot from. Or easy, because then they have a lot of creative control. I don't know. I think I try to over-manage uh, other DMs. I well, this is something that, I mean, this is something you and I talked about with the Bard Behind Bars adventure, mm. because uh, I I did I did cut a lot of what you wrote for Which that adventure. Which is good, by the way. But I think that made us a really good duo for that adventure, because I think you came to the table with a ton of really creative ideas and a really clear image of how you wanted each sort of like scene or interaction to feel. And I was able to pare it down in a way that allowed DMs to create that same feeling without necessarily using all the same like dialogue. So for me, what I found helpful when editing down Bard Behind Bars was to ask what's the goal of all of this text, yes. you know? And how can we communicate that same information in a way that allows more freedom for the DM who's reading it? You know, I, I think maybe less is more. So uh, I actually really appreciated Jenny's edits on Bard Behind Bars and you should definitely look at it because I'm very proud of the material within. What other people can take away from this this interaction we had over Bart Behind Bars is that, hey, if you're writing for other DMs, it might be a good idea to have someone read it over and edit it. Somebody who has strengths that are different from your strengths. Big thanks to Jesse for talking with me about this. If you are interested in the Bard Behind Bars adventure that Jesse wrote and then I deleted 15% of, <laughs> you can find it as a bonus printed booklet with the deluxe edition of the Natural 22 calendar, or you can get it as a PDF on my website and I'll put those links in the description. Also, if you wanna play Jesse's one shots, uh, Eve of Fall or Veilstone, I will link those too. So I'm working on a whole game gaming system with maybe a, a, an also a self-contained one-shot called Cappy Battle, in which everyone plays a sapient capybara. The world's largest rodent, if you don't know. They are the world's largest rodent. It's got its own system, its own combat rules, and it's hilarious. I think it's very funny. I will be tweeting about it a lot. We are going to uh, stream uh, a Cappy Battle game here very, very soon. I want to be a Cappy Bard. You're going to be a Cappy Bard? Can I be? Is you someone can... already a Cappy Bard? Not yet. Okay, it's me, Dibs. Um, great. I think we I did good. It. I think we made a good video. I think we did it! Yeah! That was fun. <laughs>